Good evening, Hex entrepreneurs, and welcome to episode 47 of Two Turns Ahead, which we are calling Dr. Doctor. It is February the 13th, a Friday night before the most important day of the year, Cup Day. Tonight we discuss G Prime and his team's deck that a few of them are using at the Ruby Cup, some failed experiments in deck building, and we finish by cracking open a pack to draft. So tonight is mostly constructed based uh, podcast. Our second co-host is the famously far-reaching and fetching Nicholas Podraski, who's better known throughout the community as Pinta Chills. Pinta, what are you doing to prepare your voice for the onslaught you're going to give it tomorrow afternoon and morning? I've spent most of my day just being generally upset towards G Prime for his disgusting amount of luck. Do you do any type of uh, relaxation for your vocal cords? Drink lots of milk? Uh, no, I, I, I literally do no preparation for the shoutcasting portion. Like, while I'm at work and generally through the day, I say out loud things that I plan kind of like pre recorded sentences, so to speak so that I'm able to get through them fluently tomorrow. But actually speaking a lot through the day might be the worst plan? I don't know. I got a set of fishermen's friends here. at your job, you say things like, Oh, he murdered the Vampire King. Yeah, in and in the middle people. in the middle of working, <laughs> it's like it's like I'll just be in the back and people will be in the front having coffee, and I'll just be like, "And welcome to the Ruby Cup, brought to you by," and they'll be like, "What's going on back there?" And I'll be like, "Shut up." Sounds like an excellent business. I, Our third co-host is the most Canadian least. person we ever have on the show. You big differ? You think you're more Canadian than G Prime? I I would wager that I'm at least. 0.3% more Canadian than G Prime. Like, this is not something that I'm prepared to argue whatsoever. Um, you but should it, which is just an that. attempt, <laughs> just an attempt of yours to try to sound more Canadian. No, um, I mean, this, this kind of came up when Matt said that every time that he talks to me, uh, it makes him feel like he should watch Strange Brew again. And I don't know exactly what that means, but ever since then, there's kind of been a lot of uh, jokes about being Canadian. And, well, there it uh. is. Welcome to the show, Will Gabriel, Mm -hmm. known as G Prime everywhere, mostly. Sometimes Uh, people's favorite. You have been exiled for a week Mm -hmm. uh, now because of someone recently said that you were the best on the podcast. And so, of course, we had to delay your reappearance, but you're with us after this week delay. So then what happens if somebody says that I'm the worst? Well, we have you on more. Okay, good. So just keep spreading that I'm awful and that I punch babies or something and I'll be on the podcast more often. Don't sure. say that. No, I have... Don't say that. <laughs> I mean, I think Nicholas Lurie says that quite a bit. No. And I had a question I was going to ask you, something about, oh, are you doing anything to ramp up for the tournament tomorrow? Because of the three of us, you're the only one who's capable of playing in it, since you're not running the tournament. Yeah. Do you... Mental preparation or anything? Um, I mean, no, not really. I've... I don't want to like tax myself too much that my brain is completely mush tomorrow. So I've been practicing a lot over the last week, and I think it's probably time for me to just put it down and take a breather, relax, and then when I get into it tomorrow, I should have a fresh brain. That's kind of the idea. Whether or not that's the case, we'll see how I do. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump into our first stop because it's related to that last question, mm-hmm. which is the deck that you will be running tomorrow called Dr. Citadel. Yes. Go ahead and... Uh, Tell us what's in it and take us through it a little bit. Well, so it's called Dr. Citadel, and I think that's a name that maybe Matt Miller came up with. And Dr. DR <coughs> stands for Diamond Ruby. Maybe it was maybe it was Michael that came up with it. Anyway, um, so what it does is it pretty much takes a uh, mono diamond core. You've got your soul marble, you've got your living totem, you've got your angel of dawn, your hope heart unicorn. And it, it leverages some things that Ruby affords you, like uh, the easy and uh, efficient removal of Crackling Bolt and a little bit of ramp in Scrap Tech Brawler that lets you bring out stuff like Turn 5 Citadel of, Ad- Citadel of Adamant, which is why it's called Dr. Citadel. And um, also lets you play something like Zakir, because usually it's a little bit more expensive than you're able to play early on. And even if you don't have either of those big things that you can cast, you can still use those extra resources that you have from Scrap Tech Brawler to feed a Living Totem or to feed Soul Marble. Um, so with that, the deck seems pretty solid, and it also has the extra bonus of being able to bring in stuff like Heat Wave that uh, Ruby has access to, something that Diamond doesn't really have as a cheap board wipe to deal with Gorefeast decks. Um, 
Can you just give us the rundown of what's in the deck? What's in the deck? Okay, I mean, I could... Uh, it's, you know, ruby shards, diamond shards, and then the dual shard, Shard of Conquest, and then I listed Soul Marble, Living Totem, Angel, Dawn, Hope, Heart, Unicorn already. There's also uh, some main deck Meeks to deal with stuff that has low attack and really works very well against Gorfius decks. It works well against stuff like uh, the Paladin of Necropolis, stuff like... Uh, Killipede, anything that's got low attack that is otherwise threatening for other reasons. Um, and then stuff like Cerulean Mentalist, which can be pretty scary. Uh, Citadel of Adamant, obviously, which is in the name. Scrap Tech Brawler, which helps ramp into that. Hope Heart Unicorn did say that already. Zakir, which is just super fun. There's probably other troops that fit in that slot just fine. Uh, like we've got uh, Ash Harpies in the reserves to deal with decks that just will be able to remove that Zakir every time you play it. But Zakir is fun and very daunting to see on the board. You have to deal with it, or your opponent's basically going to win the next turn or the turn after that. What champion do you run, G Prime? I can't believe that I haven't addressed that yet. Rutherford Banks is the one that uh, that I've decided to run. There was it was either that or Dimid um, when we first were looking at this deck, and Future just basically threw the list together. And over the last week, Which I've been is how trying you know to. It's good. Yeah, well, of course that's how you know it's good. Over the last week or two, I've been trying to figure out what needs to be done to the list. And funny thing is, the main list itself didn't really need any adjustments aside from changing the champion from Dim to Rutherford Banks, which I find um, is a lot better for bringing back stuff like Zakir when it dies, stuff like Living Totem that you've already poured a lot of resources in and you'd like to get back. Um, or you can use Rutherford Banks to bring back a Scrap Tech Brawler so you can afford something in your hand that you wouldn't be able to afford otherwise. And that's a really cool trick. So in terms of the hero power, what target have you used it most on? Probably used it most on Angel of Dawn just because it's very often for them to get killed early on and for me to want to bring them back. Um, but probably the second thing is Scrap Tech Brawler to like be able to play Citadel of Adamant out of my head. Also, just because you're already generally at 7 well, five to seven resources, getting the Scrap Tech Brawler, and then having the resources to both play and finish a Soul Marble. Mm -hmm. The dwarves are very uh, efficient sculptured. Sculptists? Sculptists? Sure. Yeah. Sculpture, sculpturers? Well, I think the Scrap Tech Brawler just kind of feeds Artisans. the uh, the artist, the uh, sculptor, a bunch of you know hexing gems, and that just makes them more efficient at doing their job. That's I think that's how that card works. The main, the main power of the deck actually stems uh, from the pilot's ability to draw a turn two angel literally every time you play the game against him. Okay, now Nick's got this thing about the deck always having something to do turn well, two. Well, it does always have a turn two play. I'm not trying to deny that. Yeah. It's, it, you know, because it's always got either a soul marble. Well, not always, but it Very statistically often. will have a soul marble or a living totem on turn two, both of which are things that you generally don't want to be staring down on turn two in just about any deck. Mm -hmm. But in addition, if you're G Prime, you also usually get a turn two, three, four, five angel. And that's, that can be really difficult to deal with. I, and I mean one on yeah. each of those turns. So well, hopefully that practice luck in will carry over. In addition to the two he kept in his hand. Yeah. Hopefully that uh, that practice luck will carry over into the tournament tomorrow. But I hope it doesn't. I hope he gets stomped. <laughs> We'll see, I guess. You better turn. You better turn your stream on. You're going to be the featured match that we follow around. Going to make sure everyone knows every card in your deck. Uh -huh. I think I'm probably not going to stream until the top eight if I make it. Oh, I'm not going to stream until the top eight if I make it. Yeah. So part of the reason why we're talking about this deck is because it's not Gorfius, and people have expressed disinterest in Gorfius as a whole. Mm. And this is uh, presumably something that might have a decent matchup against Gorfius. Right. Uh, let's just briefly mention the reserves. You have four Frost Wizards, two Burns, four Heat Waves, one additional Soul Marble, so you only have three in the main board. Uh, one Meek, same three Meeks in the main board. Ash, Harpy, two of those, and then one Hope Harpy Unicorn. Yeah. Tell us how your tests against Scorpius have been going so far. Well, they weren't doing very well in the reserves phase for the longest time because I was taking out the Soul Marble, thinking that it was too slow, and bringing in a lot more early removal to take care of, uh, you know, that... Cerulean Mirror Knight and stuff like that that you're going to be worried about early on. So I brought in all of the burns. I brought in four burns. I used to have four burns in the reserves, and I brought in four heat waves and stuff like that. But I've, um, I, I, I spoke with Future about it a little bit, and he feels like uh, Soul Marble is necessary still in that matchup, despite being slow. And ever since I trusted him on that, um, 
that analysis, I guess, it's been a lot better in the post-reserves matchup versus, like, I, I've won every game since. I haven't played that many. But uh, every game since making that change in the reserves, it's been much better. Well, for other people who are deck building, what does the match come down to? What are the key cards in the matchup? Well, you, you definitely want Meeks because there's a lot of targets for Meek in uh, in that uh, in that Gorefeast deck. Like stuff that Burn doesn't kill, for example, Cerulean Mentalist, which you do want to be able to take care of. Uh, Soul Marble, once you actually have a Soul Marble online, the game is pretty much unreachable for your opponent. And Scrap Tech Brawler is actually a really, really big deal because you can throw a bunch of troops on the board and your opponent can't swing like can't swing with three troops and gore feast and win the game if you've managed to throw two scrap tech rollers ahead and still have those resources to pump up your soul marble or your living totem give it swift strike or something like that penta uh based on your expert opinion of what you think people are defaulting to what do you expect the meta to look like tomorrow or two days ago since this, people will be listening to this on tuesday i expect a large abundance of blood uh i mean there's gonna be there's going to be a certain amount of gore feast uh, lists available just because a lot of people are going to be... Like, there's actually a lot of new players on the list, so what I expect is for a lot of them to, and I use the term loosely, net deck the Hextex Open Top 8 list, which does include quite a few gore fe- feast lists. Like, somebody new coming into the game who doesn't have like a predetermined hatred for gore feast burning deep within their soul... Uh, or likes we'll, wants to win. <laughs> yeah, uh, might look at the list and go, "Oh, there's there's like five or six or seven or eight of those things. Let's grab com- some of those. Oh, they're cheap. Weird." Um, but then they'll go to buy the Cerulean Mirror Knights and be like, "Whoa, <laughs> that's not right." Um, but I also expect a lot of blood because, in general, blood is blood and diamond both have fairly favorable cards against Gore Feast, I would say. Not so much Gore Feast, but against Ruby Sapphire. Um, the ability to get any sort of health back helps. The ability to delay damage. I actually... I would be surprised if we don't see plenty of Drowned Shrines kicking around in reserves, or uh, even, like, maybe a couple of Blinding Lights just kicking around in the... Uh, in the reserves, or maybe even in people's main deck. Okay, so given Beyond Gore Feast, we have Blood Diamond and Blood that might will likely make an appearance just due to popularity, and also their increasing strength. How do you expect your Dr. Citadel deck to do against those two matchups? Um, in testing, it's actually been pretty good. Against Blood Diamond, it's actually come overwhelmingly ahead. Against Mono Blood, it seems a little bit more even, um, but it's not far enough ahead for blood that it's going to be that much of an issue, I don't think. And it's maybe even 50-50 or slightly towards uh, the Dr. Citadel deck. The one deck that I'm hoping to not see a lot of, and it's a deck we don't see a lot of anyway, so that could be a good sign, is uh, is Eternal Light. And that is a deck that we've found is particularly strong against this uh, against this deck. I it's think just, it might actually just be really strong right now. Well, I mean, it, it might be just really strong right now, period. But, uh, I mean, the, the fact that all it takes is a couple of good Relentless Corruptions um, or for it to become fully online with its health gain and impact of pain, and you're, you're done. Like, it's over. And this deck is slow enough that it can't really beat down before they get to that point. So, yeah, I really hope I don't see very many of those. So our team has been flirting with uh, Diamond Ruby decks for quite a long time. One of the earlier versions, I'll call the deck Angel Fire. I just for a bit lack of a better name at the moment, Mm -hmm. but used a Diamond Ruby and it was more of a burn heavy deck. It had burn to the ground. So this was mostly uh, tested by Kenneth and it had angels, of course. It had living totems. It also liked to run Dimmed with that deck and run Drew's Colossal Walker because it's a really nice you know, two-step combo that one you already have on the board with Dimmed's champion power, mm-hmm. hero power. And this is another Diamond Ruby deck with a much different focus because there's more Diamond Ruby control as opposed to Diamond Ruby Burn. And Diamond Ruby Burn had some decent matchups occasionally against Eternal Life just because it can burn through damage unexpectedly. Yeah. Now, the one persistent problem, and 
Canthan tested it quite a bit against Scorpius because that's the deck he wanted to beat six, seven, eight months ago as well. But one of the biggest problems with Diamond Ruby, as powerful as it is against Scorpius and everything else, is that it doesn't have draw. So have you had problems with this apparent weakness? You have no way to draw cards. Um, not really. I mean, with Soul Marble and Living Totem, usually there's enough to do if you just have resources and there's somewhere to throw them. As long as you have those sinks, really flooding out isn't that big a deal. And I had one game where my opponent actually complained about Flood, and they were two resources behind me, and I was way ahead of them because I just kept on pouring resources into Living Totem. Um, if I don't have either of those, it's not great, but again, I mean, there's also Rutherford Banks who uh, takes seven charges, so drawing more resources to bring back something from your grave is also nice. It, it seems a lot more consistent with Rutherford Banks and with those uh, resource sinks. Penta, you were testing Blood against this deck, right? Uh, at once, yeah. Which blood deck were you using? Uh, I was using just a mono blood. Uh, control or paladin? Control. Well, mid, mid, middle of that board. Okay. Like, so it, probably, it was a Gauzic deck, so I guess paladin. Okay, I'm probably asking because one thing that our listeners may not know is that in the eight person queues, there's been an increasing popularity of using a mono blood deck that uh, centralizes around using Paladin, the uh, Pal. Well, what's the Paladin's Paladin? Paladin and the Necropolis. Necropolis. There we go. I almost said again, I knew that was incorrect. <laughs> not Paladin again, Paladin and Necropolis. Yep. Uh, and it seemingly pretty powerful against Scorpius, and I expect, based on the popularity of people who I don't know who they test with, it's just been kind of an evolution where you go in there, you get beat down by a deck, and you start playing that deck because it's winning a lot. This Paladin deck has gained popularity, and I expect that we'll see a handful of them tomorrow, and we may even see one or two get to a top eight because it has a decent matchup against the Gorfis deck, and it probably has an okay matchup against Blood Diamond as well, depending on how the draws go in Game 1, and then Game 2 and Game 3, they could do a lot better with the reserves than the Blood Diamond deck. And you think you have a good matchup against it? It's, it seems pretty close. Like, I can't really tell one way or another if it's really strong for either deck, um, but it does seem like it's not going to be anything more than 60-40 in either direction. How many games have you played against them? Uh, I only played the one match, and then before me, uh, Matt played a match against Flipperon, and it didn't go too well, so I was worried that there might be something wrong with the deck, but they told me um, after the fact that it was actually a pretty close game, and it just so happened that the uh, Mono Blood deck managed to get the right top decks to win. Okay, I partly ask about how many times you play against the match, because one of the things we know about constructive testing is that often what we base our assumptions on around what a win rate is, is a little bit of theory crafting, mm-hmm. but also some testing. And often, especially for a big tournament like this, where you're pressed to test as much as possible, but you don't have infinite time, our sample sizes are really small. And so having six games or five games against Mono Blood gives you a snapshot, but it doesn't control for things like the pilot or the build yeah. that they were using. Yeah, and you have to test and, against a whole bunch of decks too. So you got to factor yeah. that into the fact that you have limited time. And there are, you know, half a dozen decks that you're very likely to have trouble against in the meta that you need to be prepared for. And, uh, of course, that time to be able to learn how to react to certain things in the deck is important, and then knowing how well your deck does so you know how to f- like form the reserves to deal with the, the meta efficiently. It, you know, it's, it's, it's not trivial how much preparation the tournament requires beforehand. I just know there's been many times where I've tested a matchup enough times, or I thought enough times, like, oh, this is a trivial matchup, I know what to do, this is how I win, and then go into a tournament, not just with Hex, but with other games as well, and just get crushed by the same matchup, and it's because either the person who was test- I was testing with did not pilot it expertly, because they're working on their own decks, and they weren't playing that, and they don't have much exposure to it, mm-hmm. and there's been times when I've been asked to pilot decks, and I've been terrible at it. Uh, especially in Wild TCG, I, when uh, helping someone prepare for a huge tournament, played lots of games against a matchup he's worried about. He beat me every time, and then he went to a tournament and lost every single one of those matchups he played mm. against. It's like, huh, you're really bad playing that game, Zuber, or that deck. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, apparently. <laughs> and that's and that's the major advantage to having someone like Future or someone like Anima uh, in the play group because they're really, really good at piloting the Gorefeast deck. So if you want to test yeah. against Gorefeast and you want to know whether or not your deck can beat Gorefeast with a really strong strong pilot, then having them is a huge asset. Or if I'm available, Blood Diamond. 
And a lot of us have our expertise. I mean, but also you and Penta became really good with Gorfies for very much the similar reason that people kept on asking you to play Gorfies, yeah. and so you became good with it as well. But unfortunately, I can't test the deck against myself because I know too much. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I I, I can't just his brain take is just no. too full of no. information <laughs> what compared saying, to the other what players. I'm saying, what it's I'm really saying. hard to keep okay, his don't information. Put, don't put words in my mouth because he I'm... knows the cards in both hands if he's playing both go. decks, so he doesn't go. play optimally due to the fact. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Also, he's smarter than everyone. What's the implication? I, I did not say that. You There's been plenty of times I... where I've self tested against uh, myself, and even in hex, right? Because I Mike doesn't mind knowing more than everyone. <laughs> and I think you can pretend enough like you don't have the information that you actually do have in front of you and play it as if you didn't have that. But you're right, it is hard. Mm -hmm. Penta, any thoughts about Diamond Ruby? Do you um, expect him to get O2 drop? Do I expect G Prime to go O2 drop? No, I expect him to make a lot of people mad with Angels of Dawn. Uh, specifically, I expect the deck to do fine because it does a couple of things very well. Um, I'm not sure how well it's going to do against some of the outlier decks, like some of the just like random stuff that you come up against. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm not really sure how it does against just like a swarmy beatdown, uh, like any sort of like Ruby Wild or Mono Ruby or Mono Wild uh, might have chances against it. Mm -hmm. I think it has favorable matchups pretty much around the board. I personally wish that uh, for anyone in our playgroup that's actually running the deck, I kind of wish they would put in one Gore Feast. In, it just maybe into the reserve somewhere. Maybe in the main deck, replace one of those Citadels. Uh, not to ever play it. Um, I would prefer they never played the Gore Feast, but just to have it there so that it's you know in the deck list. And so when people are reading it, they're like, oh, Ruby, Diamond, Soul Marble, Solitary Exile, Crackling Bull, a Gore Feast! Oh! Again! But, uh. Yeah, I don't think it really fits in the deck, though. Uh, you, you've, never attacked, concern. you've <laughs> never attacked with Rage One Castle Walls. Thank you very much. Sure, but they're defenders, right? Uh, excuse me, what? Castle Walls, are they so not defenders? So that proves the point. You haven't done that. Excuse me? Are you just admitting to not doing the thing that I said you weren't doing? Okay. Also, also it's defensive, not defender. <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, it. I think it'll do fine. Like, it's definitely a cool list. Mm. Uh, I think it's got a lot of testing. I know that. I know that it's basically just been a hot topic in our playgroup for a while. So I guess that's kind. Of, it's kind of hard for me to commentate on this because. You know, I've done my best not to look at what everyone was doing leading up to the Ruby Cup, and I was kind of doing my own thing off on the side. And I have something I'm really excited about, and then all of a sudden everyone's like, Look at this thing! And it's like, yeah, that's pretty cool and stuff, but, I, yeah. You will care when it comes to the Hex Dex Open, though. Yeah, I mean, I'll care about a lot of stuff after the Ruby Cup. Like, I care about the Ruby Cup fundamentally, and I want it to do well, and I want the people in our playgroup to do well, but I want everyone to do well, mm -hmm. so... So one thing I would expect is a sort of mirror match because Cyrus uh, partly had, did well in the VIP tournament twice with a Ruby Diamond deck and advertised it on Twitter. I believe Jasmine Jada was the one who originally built a deck for him. And have you taken a look at that deck list? No, I haven't, but now that you say so, I might want to. So I just, just so I know what to be prepared for. So I'm posting it in chat now if you take a look at it there. Okay. I'm curious... It's kind of the traditional one that we used to use when we were testing six or seven months ago. It's a Dimid deck uh -huh. that has some direct damage. It has Drew's Colossal Walker, um, but somewhat similar to yours. It doesn't run Citadel. Mm -hmm. It has Drew's in the, in the reserves. How do you think your matchup goes down against the this pseudo mirror match? Um, from what I'm looking at, it doesn't look like there's anything that the deck can't answer. Uh, per se, but you do want to have like solitary exile for Drew's Walker, and if you don't, Drew's Walker is yeah. going to be a big pain. You, that that like that's the thing, right? You yeah. only have one answer for Drew's Colossal Walker, yeah. which I suppose looking at it now is a card that's kind of fallen out of favor in a couple of decks, but I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. Drew's Colossal Walker is still just a beating. I th I think that deck that I'm looking at right here, the one that Cyrus was running, um, doesn't have soul marbles. 
So I, I kind of feel like if you ever complete a soul marble, you've he, you've he does he does have four off. evolved. Oh, does he have four? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's hard to read because they like now that they've updated Skype, like it's just this white and blue mess, and I I don't know mm-hmm. my screen's too bright or something. Um, I don't know. I think it's I, I think you guys are basically running the same idea. It's just it's colossal walkers instead of like citadels and scrap decks. Yeah, but I, I do think uh, pre-reserves at least. Um, the version of the deck that we're running has a little bit of an edge because the four heat waves in his deck don't really do too much against the main deck version. Um, the Meeks don't really do much unless he manages to luck out and get a living totem before we can, you know, pump it up. He only has two main deck solitaire exiles, so there's not a whole lot to deal with our soul marbles. Um, and of course, he could luck out with Angel of Dawn, just like Angel of Dawn, like we could. Um, and Drew's Colossal Walker could be a problem potentially, but yeah, I think in general. It's got a good matchup pre-reserves. Post-reserves, I think it's a lot more up in the air. The heat waves is something to be careful about. If you see a opposing Dimid who has dropped a diamond and ruby shard, mm-hmm. that you don't want to play your totem on turn two. Yeah, that's true. I'm not sure how aggressive you are with your totem, so I imagine you're a little bit aggressive in ruby diamond more than you would be with blood diamond. Yeah, it's, it's all matchup dependent. Sure. As it should be. Actually, I was kind of surprised to see solitary exiles in your main board, because... Uh, that's something I've been considering in other decks like Blood Diamond of taking out of the main board and putting it in reserves. Partly because they don't feel as strong against Gorfies. Things like Time Ripple make you really sad when you use them on uh, suboptimal targets. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to use a uh, Solitary Exile on a Falcon Falconer. Yeah. I mean, you just have better answers, I guess, for the Falconers. Like the Meek. Well, yeah, I mean, in uh, when you reserve against Falconers, you do take out um, those solitary exiles and bring in heat waves, which is a more effective form of removal. Um, but pre-reserves, it's also with the things that uh, the Gorenites deck has to side out and then bring in against you. Like that, having those four cards that aren't as good, it doesn't hurt your deck as much as you'd think, and it's still a strong matchup uh, pre-reserves. Okay. Any other concluding thoughts before we move forward? Um, well, there's there's at least three of us running that deck in our team uh, in the tournament tomorrow, so I hope that at least one of us can bring top eight, because I, I do love this deck, and I hope that it does well. Who else is running it? Uh, I know that Future's running it, and I'm pretty sure that Flipperon's running it, and there might be another couple of people who may or may not play, or may or may not decide to run it instead of something else. There's a few other decks that are floating around within the playgroup, so we'll see. Okay. So our second topic is another constructed topic. Don't worry, people. We will get back to draft in a future episode. And it's something that, partly because we were thinking about the Ruby Cup and we didn't want to make a episode devoted to the Ruby Cup, which becomes outdated in a couple days before the episode airs because the Ruby Cup happens before the episode is released. And occasionally on this podcast, we've provided deck lists of things that were work in progress. But the last time we did that was... I believe when Jeremy Crawley first said, you know, I have this kind of neat idea with uh, this really mirror night and storm call and other things. And it was kind of one of the proto examples of, uh, well, not Gore Nice at the time. It was Gore Storm. And we haven't done it so much on the podcast in a long time. And so this topic, I forgot why I called it in the show notes, decks that have yet to be. So we all have decks that we've worked on and that we keep on coming back to and try to improve a little bit better over time. And for whatever reason, they're not working out. They're missing one or two cards or the meta's not just right for them. And one that I've always toyed with is a Dwarven Utility deck. And the part of the reason why I want to share this today is also because the first time we showed any type of constructed deck on the podcast was Tata doing a Dwarven Utility deck. And so I want to update it or want to update with set two cards. So I'll give you a, I'll tell you what's in the deck and then we could talk about a little bit where its shortcomings are and what the either meta needs to do or what cards need to do or how we could just make the deck better. So six Sapphire Shards, six Ruby Shards, and four Shards of Innovation, followed by one Terabot, uh, three Sapphire Shards, four Gearsmiths, three Peaks, two Time Ripples, one Construction Plans Crank Rocket, two Crackling Bolts, three Craze, or Careful Rummaging, not Craze, three Careful Rummaging, one Recovery Specialist, three Verdicts of the Ancient Kings, 
one secret laboratory, one vol cannon, one construction plan spot shop, four crackling vortex, one chaos key, one juice colossal walker, one construction plans tower hulk, one warbot dropship, two robot raptures, one Argus, one eternal guardian, four forges of Kadok, and two Reeses. And so, as you may or guess, or you guess, the you have a couple different tricks in this deck. You can use Gearsmith's careful rummaging or Peaks to try to fish out the cards you need to answer what you have. And so you have a lot of one ofs in the deck, so you can get the answer you want as opposed to having redundancy. And then you also have things like the Secret Laboratory or other sacrifice effects where you can just ditch artifacts into the graveyard and get back with either the Specialist or the Robot Rapture. This deck does okay in some matchups, but it doesn't do well in the general meta. And the reason why I like the deck is just being able to fish for answers is always fun. It feels like a combo deck because you're filtering your deck for the things that you like, but it doesn't have combo pieces. It has things like a Volcanon or a Hargus. So let's go ahead and get initial reactions, though you guys are familiar with this archetype for a very long time. Pinta, what do you think about the current state of the Utility Dwarf deck? Well, I think... I think looking at it, I don't like the four Forge of Caddick. Uh, I understand why they're there, but I feel like for a for a deck where you're building with like one ofs and like a couple of set pieces, like the last thing that I'd want to do is throw back my Chaos Key and then later on need my Chaos Key specifically to answer something. Obviously, you have opportunities to throw back, say, Eternal Guardian or Argus or Warbot Dropship, things that aren't going to be coming into play for several turns, even if you do hit things, but I do like that the combination of Gearsmith and Careful Rummaging give like a lot of draw power to the to the deck, like just things that you can do to find other, like just immediate plays, like they make your opening hand stronger, in essence, obviously Gearsmith can whiff, and uh, it does often, but it won't in this it won't as often in this deck, there's just a ton of things to hit, uh I imagine, actually, if you do whiff with Gearsmith here, you just feel really cheated. Uh, careful Rummaging will whiff even less, and as one drops, you basically keep one or two in your opening hand and just assume that they're going to be better cards. And you get to choose those better cards, which is great. Uh, not such a big fan of the peaks, uh, because the lack of Sapphire means you're often peaking for, like, I, you know, two to three. Uh, yeah. Naturally, that's not too bad when you're already putting Gearsmith up on a pedestal and it's a quick action so you can play it at the end of your opponent's turn. Uh, the first thing I see like immediately is obviously it doesn't fare well against uh, aggro at all with only two time ripples, uh, very few troops, two crackling bolts kind of help. Uh, well, the sappers, the Gearsmiths, the ripples... The sappers help... Um, the and those are things pulse. you can recur sometimes later on. Yeah. But yeah. I suppose. Um, I don't know. I think it looks really cool. I think, I think another thing that I don't like is that the bot shop has so few robot targets. Uh, it hits Terrobot. It hits the Druze. It hits the Terrobot and the Druze. Yeah. Sometimes it also hits the Druze. But still... Never hits a Warbot dropship. I, I mean, that card, even when I get in draft, it's almost always just draw a card for three yeah. as opposed to... And that's <laughs> get that's still pretty cost. effective. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, a research librarian is draw a card for potentially three or four, but it's also a a troop. And you meant to say draw a card for three. That's what he said. And you said... I, oh, I thought he said for two. Oh. I might have yeah. just been spaced out. Um... I like the robotic rapture, but I don't see a lot of these artifacts going to the grave. Uh, obviously, your crank rocket does eventually some of your sappers charges, maybe the robot troops, but most of the other things stick on the board pretty hard, so robotic rapture as a 2 of doesn't feel great. Well, it's probably a extinction response, but also secret lab. It's, it's an extinction response? Yeah, it helps secret lab. See, but that's the thing, is like I almost feel like, uh, I don't know. With so many gearsmiths and the chance to make those secret laboratories just a little bit cheaper, maybe like another another secret lab instead of say the, like one of the forges. I, I don't know. It's hard. To, sure. It's hard to say. Like I'm just looking at this first opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I think it does well as a toolbox, obviously, uh, because that's exactly what it is built to do and does. Um, I think it's missing a singleton boulder toss. I think if you're gonna play, t I think if you're gonna play Tower Hulk and you're not gonna play Boulder Toss, you're missing out on the single best Boulder Toss target in the game. So I've actually not played the deck with the Tower Hulk in there. I partly added it in there because I know how much you love that card. I'm like, oh, I, yeah, I think it's probably works super out in this deck. Yeah, and this is a type of deck thing that can actually use the Tower Hulk well. So I just haven't had a chance to play test it since I've added it. Well, there's one thing that I noticed in particular about this deck, and I see that you have um, 10 sources of ruby in the deck, yeah. and only two cards, two crackling bolts in all 60 cards uh, require that ruby. <laughs> have you found crackling bolt to be particularly necessary? Those could, obviously, those could obviously be time ripples or... That's what I'm kind yeah, of feeling. Like, like one more sapper's charge and... Like, no, I missed that entirely. I think that's partly just because it had a lot more ruby yeah. in it at one point. And, and I mean, if, if you manage to take that out, and... then you have a much more powerful peak because then you're running all yeah. sapphire. And I see you've got uh, crackling vortex as well, and it, like two charges yeah, it doesn't is, have any targets. Well, two charges is nice uh, for you know two thirds of a worker bot, but is it really worth losing a sapphire for? And I think when you got that peak, I think I'd probably rather have the sapphire. It's something I'd have to play with to be sure. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know if... Well, if we remove the Crackling Bolt and you cut six Ruby Shards and four Shards of Innovation, so you go up to 16 Sapphire, mm -hmm. and then whether or not you cut the Forge Academy, then you may even go up to 20 Sapphire. I think Vortex is fine in that case. Yeah. I think you probably would go back up to, like, you would cut the Forge, you'd probably start running Counter Magics. Because, yeah. like, that's, that's, like, the whole point, right? Is, like, you're a toolbox, but you also... Like most good toolbox decks from Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, you know the the World of Warcraft trading card game, the other one, uh, all tend to have not just answers of their own, but they tend to avoid having to answer things in the first place. Like that's that's the best tool, right? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. either just having bigger things or having a, a more like a like a, a dominant answer like oh sure you might have an ash harpy but i have a counter magic and a crank rocket you know like those two things are better than your ash harpy i'm wording it poorly but words words and things so is this is this list going to be available in the show notes people can kind of mess around with it themselves and yeah oh, of course right uh yeah the same thing with the ruby diamond list is that both of those things are going to be available mm -hmm. um I'd be so interested in I'd be interested in seeing like if you're if you're a watcher a listener a watcher a podcast in in Biber if you would uh, take a look at the list you know, I don't know make some changes make a list and put it in the show uh, like in a comment or something mm -hmm. that'd be cool I'd be I would look at those like show us a video well, so of the deck performing maybe it'd be pretty cool or yeah. if you do something amazing like get a 40-40 Tower Hulk into play against a real opponent or use the deck or a variation of it to win the Hextex Open perhaps at the end of the month <laughs> yeah I mean obviously would I, would, I would I would appreciate it if the Dwarf deck won the Ruby Cup mm -hmm. uh, but, but they won't be able to use this one because won't you, come you won't, yeah you won't be hearing this before the end yeah. I was just clarifying because so Part of this is to spark another conversation beyond the deck itself, and so you can keep on thinking about the deck if you have other suggestions as we move forward. But which deck? Uh, the dwarf deck. Oh, I already. But forgot in it. regards Sorry. to Penta, uh, are there? What's the deck that you keep on coming back to that you can't quite make work, but you want to make work? Is there a particular archetype or a shark combination? Ruby Wild. Um, okay, there's a couple of things. I play. I play a dwarf deck uh, on the on the proving grounds. Often, I want to say, uh, which is uh, very heavily based around playing a cheap construction plans tower hulk uh, and boulder tossing a bajillion damage at my opponent's face. Uh, it's is a very simple concept, but it's one that catches people off guard a lot because the dwarves, like I said, have so many options. But as far as like an actual competitive, like I want this to work very well archetype goes, I. I would really like to see Sapphire Wild work. Uh, the pieces fit together in my head like it should be viable. It works 
kind of to the same tune as a, a couple of decks that I've enjoyed in previous uh, card games, not just Magic, but uh, it works very similar to a deck that I enjoyed in... Uh, not the World of Warcraft, in, in different trading card games, but specifically one also in Magic, um, not to beat around the bush. And I, I don't know, I just feel like... I feel like the set pieces are either there or if if they're missing, they're missing on like this basis that uh, that just they don't fit into the meta. If that makes sense, it's not that the cards are bad; it's just that the meta is isn't where it, that deck needs to be. The deck might be tier one if X and X weren't being played in that mm-hmm. tournament. There's also a couple of things like, obviously, the lack of Fisher Smith, Fisher Smith playability right now uh, changes like a lot of what's viable. Like, I think Fisher Smith actually makes Soul Marble a little harder to play, uh, so forth and so forth. But yeah, Sapphire Wild is the deck I I would like to build. It's something like just to try to give an outline. Uh, Okan ceremonies. Uh, Mentor of Okenge? Uh, yeah, maybe Mentor of Okenge. I, I've considered Mentor of Okenge, but I think, like, you might be... If you're talking about Sapphire or Wild, you're probably looking at uh, just wanting the action of of Okenge, not necessarily the troop, because on two you want to be playing, like, Munario Sensei to draw a card, or, like, you're holding up Time Ripple or whatever. And just playing threats that those shards have that and nothing else can really deal with so to speak so like storm storm colossus which is a seven cost flight spell shield six six which i i don't think anything in the game deals with outside of extinction right now uh or at least not very well and then things like elder streamer with the spell shield gem inside of it the uh major wild orb of no it's the minor wild orb of conservation sorry so not a major gem socket at all. Um, and just things that pump those up. I, I think it might be there. I just, you know, I haven't tested around with it a whole lot. I, I believe it's the first... I ran a deck very similar to it in the... Unnamed la- Castle PvE? Well, that, and I and I don't think it ever did poorly there, but specifically in, also uh, in... The Hex TCG Pro, not the Invitational, but the last one before that, which was the first one I got to play in. I think that was July. Sure. I don't know if it performed well there, but I know that I didn't perform well at that particular event. I just, you know, wasn't there mentally, so... Sure. So, G Prime, what deck do you keep on coming back to? Um, well, Nick says uh, Sapphire Wild, and that reminds me of the Sapphire Wild uh, Briar Legion deck that I really liked uh, early on in this set one when uh, that card was first introduced to the client. Um, I think there's probably some cards in set two that enable that to happen that weren't there before, but it's not something that I've tried to build. And maybe one of these, one of these days that I have time to just mess around, I might try and build that with set two cards in mind. I also would like to revisit the uh, Sapphire diamond or sorry, so I should say diamond Sapphire to be alphabetical. Um, cosmic transmogrifier deck, or maybe even other colors or uh, no, shards. Man, the cosmic, tr- the ca- cosmic transmog deck is something that I want to be a thing so bad, and it might I th- I, be possible. Yeah, it just yeah, yeah. I mean, there's stuff that works with it. It's it's again, it's just a matter of like what other things exist mm-hmm. in the meta at the given time. It's not even necessarily an issue with um how the how the the cards or the deck performs it's just a matter of what exists yeah. to play against and come to think of it that might actually work all right with ruby when you have scrap tech brawlers to bring it out earlier and they also have something else to transform that's fairly efficient and cheap so maybe that's a maybe that's a thought mm. okay one other thing that I've just thought of adding to the dwarf deck, since I have more time to think about, with a sapphire-only version, is Drew's Unrelenting Fist as another potential win condition late in the game. Just having something that pings away there can be quite useful, and other decks have been using it as a sideboard win condition. 
Mm. So, any other thoughts about maybe in a future episode, not the next one, but in a couple of weeks, we'll have you bring one of your decks to the podcast and we'll try to tr- make it as efficient as possible. Though I'll have you bring it early so we get some deck testing in. Mm. Mm-hmm. Let's open the pack. So, topic three pack draft. <laughs> <Our winner. laughs> Is a dishonorable death. Our uncommons are Pulse Reactor, Time Step Magistrate, and Excavation Bot. Our commons are Subterranean Spy, Cunning Skullcaster, Burrow Bunny, Sly Huntress, the Ilwani Birthkin, Mesmeric mm. Hypnoscientist, Royal Herald, Grave Nibbler, Vanguard of Cerulea, Sphere Oracle, and Crackling Boom. Snap pick, Crackling Boom. Call it a show. All three. So, what's your second pick, guys? So, is there any chance either of you are not first picking the dishonorable death, or should I just exclude that from the get-go? Go ahead and cut it because it's it's pretty it's pretty sick in draft, especially when people are filling yeah. their deck with so many three drops and four drops that you're like if you hit one of those, you're very likely to dump a lot from their hand. I yeah. thought you agree with that. Yeah, no, I, I think I take it. I, I'm not sure if I'm super excited about it like Will is, um, but I think it might be better than anything else in this pack by like. A, a, a fairly large margin. Removal that voids is pretty powerful on its own. Also, well, yeah, and just like a the very small else. chance of knocking something else out. Yeah. Like we'll we'll kind of hyped it up a little too much there. If you ask me, I don't necessarily. <laughs> all right. Yeah. N- well, no, because like I, I, you know, you're like, oh, if people are playing all these all these three drops, it's going to be amazing. Except if they're playing a bunch of three drops, and by the time you get to your five drop, they have two or three three drops now. Yeah, you might be. And then if you get rid of if you get rid of one more, it's kind of. Eh. I'm just remembering all I mean, the times the that I've used dishonorable it, death, and it's yeah. been it's been pretty effective in general. Well, there you go. I suppose that's fair. Okay, so we'll have Penta do the first second pick then. Ah. Uh, <sighs> so. Time set magistrate's actually pretty good. Um, I think it's been undervalued pretty heavily. Uh, Everyone disagrees with you. They're wrong, but they disagree with you. No, I mean, I mean they might not be wrong. I might be overvaluing it. I think that time set magistrate's actually just such an enabler. And even with things that are already in this pack, uh, it's very good with Sly Huntress and Royal Herald, for example. Like, I mean, it may not be fantastic with Royal Herald, but it is actually pretty good with Royal Herald. It it combos with uh, it, more rares and uncommons than commons, but it still does work with things like the one one flight, the Phoenix Guard Messenger. That when it leaves play, you draw a card. Mm-hmm. Turning that card into two cards, essentially, and a chump blocker, is actually a pretty di- big deal because your 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 ideal situation is probably going to be reaching like in any sort of sapphire set two to one draft deck you're trying to just reach your big stuff before your opponent and just kind of like play off card advantage and board control the time set magistrate provides a decent enough body that board control exists and has the ability to gain both card advantage or just like in the instance that you find a good rare or you get something like sly huntress back or you get any sort of inspire on the board and you can multi-inspire a troop, that's great. And it also, at its very worst, gives you the option of a very limited one-eye open. You can attack with a troop, use time step, as long as it's a human, then use time step magistrate's ability on it as a one-shot, and that will bring the troop back as, as if it had just entered play, which is to say ready. So... I think I take the time set magistrate here. Oh, okay. G Prime, give us two more picks. Two more, okay. Well, um, when I look at the pack, one thing that I I note is the subterranean spy. Um, I find is particularly useful in draft because who knows what kind of combat tricks your opponent has and who knows what kind of removal they have. Knowing more information about your opponent's deck can be very useful. Um... And Vanguard of Cerulea is also fairly good, though it, that does kind of marry you to, or not necessarily marry you to, but it, it makes you want to go um, at least Diamond and Sapphire, which isn't too hard. Uh, that Royal Herald probably won't come back around, so you won't see that kind of fixing. Um, but it should be easy enough to get more of that later on. But I think the Spirit Oracle is probably my second pick past Dishonorable Death, just because it's the only 
wild card in this pack whatsoever, and it actually is pretty powerful. A 4-4 uh, four, four for 5 that allows you to add plus 1 uh, when you gain a charge, plus 1, plus 1 to any troop uh, when you gain a charge, and that could be itself as well. So that's a powerful enough card, and the fact that no one else is going to be in wild looking at this pack in itself um, leads to a potentially pretty good draft. Uh, I think it's it's a hard choice for my third pick between Subterranean Spy and Vanguard of, Karulia, Vanguard of Cerulea, but I think I'm going with the Spy. Okay. How do you evaluate the Spy? How do I evaluate? He just did. I mean, I kind of, yeah. That was that was his whole thing he just said. So it's a 3-2. Yep. Uh, you tell for two turns, yep. and it allows you to... Oh, as a body? As a body, it's way better hand. than people give it credit for. <laughs> so as a 3-2... Compared to a, is it better than a blank 3-3? Three, three? Probably. How much value do you attach to the ability to look at your opponent's hand? It, well, it's, it's kind of hard to say exactly. Um, it is very it valuable at least see. once. Like, <laughs> to, to, to know that much information about your opponent's deck right off the bat, and be, being able to play around combat tricks is huge in draft because tempo means so much. Um, I, th I think it's definitely worth the cost of admission. Um, especially the fact that it's also a body after you do see those two turns worth of cards. And and a three attack body is actually really useful. I'm not too worried about losing that one defense when you know, it, it makes you susceptible to the one pack worth of burn, uh, which is not a big deal. It's probably going to be trade bait anyway, and, you know, three attack takes care of a lot. All right, so for my additional picks, the Time Step Magistrate would normally be very tempting to me, and Penton and I have talked about this outside the podcast a few times, and there's at least really early on in set two a time where I got a Time Step Magistrate pick seven or eight, and I was like, oh, I guess humans are open. And he's like, my humans aren't open. It's like, but Time Step Magistrate is a fantastic card. Obviously, if they're not picking it, they're not going humans. And Pento's right. People just don't like Time Step Magistrate. And since then, <laughs> I've noticed that Time Step Magistrate tables way too often. Like, the card <laughs> is good. It's solid. But people just don't like it. And so it's allowing me to be very greedy with the Time Step Magistrate and not pick a second. If mm. I was in a different draft meta that would be easily a second pick for me or would be in contention for it. So, And it's it's fair to say that you you can take a powerful card here like Spirit Oracle, yeah, and then assume that the human players are going to take Sly Huntress, Royal Herald, and uh, perhaps even the Vanguard of Cerulea. And by perhaps even the Vanguard of Cerulea, I mean the Vanguard of Cerulea, the Royal Herald, and perhaps even the Sly Huntress. I just got my words mm. crackled up there. Sure, but yeah, I I think uh, to specify. Mike was taking the Spirit Oracle there. I cut him off like a total ju fine. junk bot. Yeah. Just wanted junk to be clear. Bot. A junk bot, so yeah. The Spirit Oracle is my... Everything is telling me that I should be picking humans here, but the Spirit Oracle, or, Spirit Oracle is the right pick. Being in Wild is perfectly fine in 221. And Wild Blood, Wild Ruby, Wild Sapphire, especially Wild Sapphire, which is underdrafted currently... Flying monsters are still good. It's really hard to deal with that in 221. So if you get something like that, consider picking up a Feather Drifting Down River instead of Fuzzico, and you might have some really powerful things coming overhead. So I really want to go humans in this pack, even though it's a bad choice, and there's lots of humans in here, and the Spirit Oracle should be my second pick. So my third pick is Vanguard Cerulea, because if I get this pack and I see a Vanguard still in it, then... I am very tempted that at least two people to my right are probably not humans, or they got a really awesome rare. If this was Vanguard of Gawain and some Vanguard of Cerulea, that could, I would be tempted to make that my second pick, even more so than Spirit Oracle, because I really like Vanguard of Gawain. He's a really powerful card. And we're doing four picks here, so I'll do my fourth pick here, which will be... Oh yeah, since we all agreed on the first one, we might as well go to four of them. Mm. Um... The Slay Huntress I, is a fantastic card if I have the Inspire Troops, which I probably don't at this point, but if I did, then maybe I would be picking up the Slay Huntress. Um, I should have thought about what my fourth pick was since I knew this was coming, but I apparently mm -hmm. did not do so. I agree. I you guess it's... Um, Royal Herald? No. There has to be a better pick here than Royal Herald. No. 
I mean, I fourth pick is kind of silly because you kind of have a leaning, but you still should be picking the best card that's available mm-hmm. for you. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with the Subterranean Spy. That allows me to float two different archetypes at this point, or actually three with Sapphire Flyers. So I'll just be agreeing with G-Prime for this, but it'll be my fourth pick instead. So G-Prime, what is your fourth pick? Uh, you're right, it is kind of hard to pick here. I think I'd probably go with the Mesmeric Hypnoscientist just because it's a dwarf that uh, can surprise opponents with five damage out of nowhere. Um, it can also help you swing it with something else, and it is a dwarf at the end of the day. There's not really anything else in this pack that feeds that dwarf robot deck except for Excavation Bot, and that will come back around because nobody plays Excavation Bot. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I Well, I mean... You can do very well with it. I played against a person who got very lucky and had four excavation bots, and that wrecked me because everything was popping out super early. Because the excavation bot to excavation bot into excavation bot into a mesmeric hypnoscientist, and there's not much you can do at that point. No, but how often does something like that dead. happen? And you don't want to use excavation bot on something like <laughs> Subterranean Spy that you'd rather stay underground for another turn most times. Maybe. The extra damage is nice. So, Penta, you get pick three and four for us? Assuming that it's working, Grave Nibbler is my third pick. Uh, That's a good pick. A 2-2 two, two for two is way better than people are giving it credit for. A lot of people are discounting 2-2s two for two for very odd reasons. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm not... And speaking of 2-2s two, for twos, the Ilyuni Murthkin in this deck, in this pack is perfectly fine to fill out that curve... Because that gives you yeah, something really no, to play. I mean, like a lot, uh, yeah, like a lot of people like. like I, I don't think it's great. Like, don't don't take this wrong, and it's not the reason I'm taking Grave Nibbler. But there are certainly people who look at something like uh, a Cottontail Scout, which is a two-two for three air quotes, which is actually a Tunnel One troop as well, and you tunnel it on turn two. And it pops up on turn three and is attacking as a two two, which means in all for all intents and purposes, it's a two two for two. They just can't act as a blocker that, that first turn. That couldn't act as a blocker, but surprises your opponent and has the additional upside of being able to tunnel a troop in your hand for free. And more often than not, it's going to be worth waiting an extra turn to have a body on the board in addition to tunneling for free, it would be significantly stronger, in my opinion, if you were drawing before tunneling troops surfaced. That's beside the point, that's a different card. Grave Nibbler is a 2-2 two, two for 2 at its very worst, and it happens to play well in an archetype that I enjoy playing a lot, and I think a lot of people have kind of caught on to, is the Benoshi, Blood, whatever. And in, in Benoshi, Blood, whatever, you just play aggressive troops, potentially, pro- probably the most powerful of cards in set two, the most powerful of commons being the giant MF and Mosquito, mm-hmm. uh, a 1-1 with Life Drain and Flight. Uh, there's not much Flight in the set, and there's not a lot of Flight in the set that can deal with a 3-3. But, you know, the the Mosquito is only a 1-1 one, one for one. How, how do you get it to 3-3? Three, three? Well, you kill something else off with your Benoshi power, and you make, you make it a 3-3. Three, three. And then you do a little dance, have a little fun. And Grave Nibbler, A, provides a 2-2 body for 2 that you can sacrifice off easily, or B, is underground when you perform this weird blood sacrifice and becomes a 4-4. And even though it comes up a little bit behind curve, I believe, is it a Tunnel 3 or a Tunnel 2? I think it's Tunnel 2. The Nibbler? Yeah, it's Tunnel 3. Uh, so it comes up on turn 5 as a 4-4 in the perfect situation, which is actually right on curve, right? It's it's basically a 4-4 for mm-hmm. 4 at that point. So I think Grave Nibbler is a pretty strong pick. It's also a Shin Hair, which has a small amount of relevance with other cards. It means I can start taking things like Feeding the Young Ones earlier. My fourth pick is Crackling Boot. No. It's a tie between Mesmeric and Vanguard here. I think I take the Vanguard of Cerulea. Um, it's not that I have any issue with the Subterranean Spy, it's just that I don't think I'm ever going to have trouble getting a Subterranean Spy, because even the Dwarf player only ever wants one or two of them. Yeah. So I don't even think I have to worry about that until like the next pack. If I know I want a Subterranean Spy at that point, that's fine. I think right now, I either want the Vanguard of Cerulea, or I don't want to play against it. And I don't want to play against it pretty bad, because like I said, there's not a lot of flight in the set, and there's not a lot of removal in the set. And you only get one pack of set one to make up for that. 
and not everything in the... My cat's going crazy. I hope everyone on the podcast can hear that. She's running back and forth like crazy. Um, I, you, there's, you get your Vanguard of Cerulea out, and you either use Sir Giles' power, or you use uh, you know any sort of buff, like a preservation, and all of a sudden it's better than almost every flyer in set one as well. And that's really good for just a basic three drop, and you could argue that it's dual threshold, but it's not. You can play the Sapphire on turn 8, and it'll magically gain flight and plus 1, plus 1. Um, I think the card would be significantly worse, in fact, if it read something along the lines of, like, you have to have... Uh, uh, those things. If it was, like, an actual yeah. Sapphire shit. You, threshold yeah, when this, threshold. when this... En- when this enters play, if you have a sapphire threshold, right. it gains this and this. That's that would make it crazy. But yeah, it's not the way it goes. So, have you ever played a crackling boon in a draft deck yet? Never. Penta. Mm-hmm. You keep joking about it. I think I, I might have once. Yeah. Were you sober I'm... and or awake? I'm trying to remember. Like, I don't want to say no because I. Th- because there's, there's a multiple set of like possibilities here, and I think I should preface them all. It's possible I was streaming and it was a joke. Mm-hmm. It's possible that it was okay with the rares I picked up in set one. Uh, like, I might have gotten an Azawa and been like, haha, or like two or three Righteous Paladins. Or it might have been possible that I just had uh, like a Paladin of the Necropolis and... Yeah, okay. I played it, I played it in a Blood Diamond, uh, I had four Paladin and Necropolises, and it, I was playing Gauzig, and it was amazing in that deck. Uh, but that was, that was when we were playing triple set two. Ah, uh, okay. That, and, so yes, I have played it once. Final thoughts for the episode, Pinto? Um, well, it's, it's a little bit sad to detour off to, uh, purely constructed topics here when we we've been trying to make a habit of talking more about limited so like i just hope people realize that it's because there's a big constructed tournament coming up it's because g prime's terrible at draft and it's um what, what what's wrong no what? i'm just i'm waiting for you to finish good no it's okay you you sent okay um that's admittal to what i said um and it's it's just you know a little bit of a thing if if anybody has limited topics that they want to talk about. Maybe even the sealed we should talk about next week because it's just about VIP time. We probably should have talked about it this week. Um, that's... I, I mean, we'll get back to the limited stuff. The constructed stuff is cool, though. Like, it's a huge part of Hex, and I can't wait... I, I think that constructed gets a bum rap right now because the client doesn't really allow for as effective of constructed. Does that make sense? Like, we're kind of... We're kind of limited to uh, proving grounds, proving grounds, and to constructed tournaments that, despite having good value, just don't fire very often. Mm-hmm. Which, which isn't necessarily their fault. It's it's just kind of the way things are running. Um, so yeah, I, I I can't wait to get back to constructed. Yeah, or to Do limited at some final point. thoughts. Um. I just hope that uh, any of the people who are multiboxing, using one client to play the tournament and one client, the test client to play PvE at the same time, don't make any mistakes by pressing the space bar while the wrong window is focused and ruin their tournament presence by that kind of mistake. And I hope everyone had a yeah, fun time, and uh, good luck also next week for this weekend coming up in the VIP. By the way, if you push F10 on your turn after you cast a Mastery of Time in the live Play. client, does it skip both turns? Because it does no. on the test client. No. This happened to me twice now. Okay. No, it doesn't. It's um, There's a lot of bugs on the test client that don't happen on the main client yet, and they, yeah. they, they're aware of them in threads. Sure. It's, actually, it's actually kind of... Like, the main client has had a couple of weird hiccups recently that weren't necessarily part of the client until that... Uh, I've actually played away. some PvE matches this week, and Jank Feast has been... Uh, occasionally I've been skipping my own terms with Jank Feast, but okay. Mm-hmm. 
Well then, my name is Michael Allen. You can find me in game at Zubrin now on Twitch and Twitter at Zubrin underscore alpha. Nicholas Pedraski is Penta Chills on Twitch, Twitter, and game. Will Gabriel is G Prime in most places, except the places he doesn't tell me, and I randomly invite other G Primes who administer sensitive documents for the entire group. Our sound engineer for this episode is Elysian. For any updates on us streaming when we post a show or other happenings in the Hex community, follow us on Twitter at Two Turns or. Leave a comment on the show's oh, two turns ahead, sorry, or leave a comment on the show's post at two turns ahead.com, five shards.com, or Reddit, or even email us at two turns ahead at gmail.com. Also, you can always find us on our YouTube page because we have the YouTubes. Finally, if you want automatic updates, please subscribe to us on iTunes. And if you feel inclined, give us a positive rating on the iTunes store. We have not had a rating since January of this year, so we can always use more. <laughs> Rating the podcast will give other viewers a better chance of discovering the podcast on iTunes and help us grow the Hex community. Thank you all for listening. Stay lucky. I wish I remembered what Matt said over top of you and you said stay lucky last episode so I could repeat it, but I, I completely spaced on it. He said something, then you said something, he said you, you wanted to put the last word in after.